Hello again. This week I was back in the woods on a quest to make the ultimate bushcraft chair. Not a lightweight telescopic camping chair that straps to the outside of a rucksack to be carried in and out of the woods. This must be a chair made on site using only what nature provides. My self-imposed made up rules for this project stated that only standard bushcraft tools could be used. A small knife and a folding saw. The general purpose cutting tools of the bushcrafter. The chair would also need to be made on site using only the natural resources found there and harvesting those natural resources must have a minimal impact on the woodland environment. Lastly, the chair must also be comfortable to sit in and the making of it realistically fit into a 26 minute YouTube video with room left for lighting a fire, cooking a steak and harvesting sap from a silver birch. I stopped off along the way at an area of the woods with more silver birch to gather tinder for the fire. With stormy weather forecast for the mid-afternoon it made perfect sense to take advantage of the rare sunshine and squirrel some bark away for fire lighting later on. This bark sheet was taken from an already dead rotten tree. I strapped it damp side out to my rucksack to be dried by the breeze and the sunshine. As winter becomes spring, the birch tree wakes from its dormant winter state. For just two or three weeks in the early spring, its slightly sweet sap can be harvested by trimming off the end of a low branch. This method is now thought to be far less damaging to the tree than boring a hole into the trunk. Mmm, a fine vintage. The flow rate is more of a slow drip, and many people use an old plastic bottle fitted directly over the end of the branch. This tankard, previously hollowed out from a fallen silver birch branch, would make a fitting vessel for collecting the sap. I'd be back later to see how it's getting on. So, back to the chair. My construction material of choice for this woodland seating project all came from the ever useful hazel tree. In most cases, a multi-stemmed tree. Silvery grey, smooth bark with the lamb's tail catkins in early spring. Toothed, hairy leaves and the familiar and extremely tasty hazelnuts in autumn. No! No! Those are my nuts! My but you'll have to fight the squirrels my for them. Nuts. Carefully scanning the woods, I selected my frame materials for strength, straightness and any useful natural features such as Y-shaped forking branch junctions. Before cutting I always check up in the canopy to make sure that the pole isn't likely to pull down a broken or rotten tree limb with it and that it can be retrieved without getting in a tangle. Hazel rods or poles can be cut from a living tree in early spring. Green wood is easier to work with and is strong and flexible and far from damaging or killing the tree, cutting live stems, known as coppicing, will stimulate new growth and extend its natural life expectancy. I've tidied up the stump to leave a clean sloping cut to shed rainwater and lessen the chances of introducing rock to the stool or the base of the tree. Although Hazel doesn't mind some careful and selective pruning, always seek permission before cutting and taking green wood, especially with old veterans like this one. Without a drill and other specialist green woodworking tools to make mortise and tenon style joints, I'd need some strong and flexible bindings to lash my hammock style chair together. Young hazel rods can be twisted up into a withy, a process of softening the fibres without breaking or snapping to make an already flexible sapling bendy enough to tie lashings and knots. Basically, a natural and grippy rope. Spend time choosing the right shoot. It must obviously be green with no significant branches or kinks and as long as possible, and somewhere between little finger and thumb thick at the base where it joins the tree. Getting started can be the hardest bit and requires a grip of steel. 
Using the thinnest, snappiest parts to add bulk to the skinny tip of the withy can help with grippage. The withy will naturally curve itself into a crank shape, which can be carefully wound. Bigger circles means less effort when twisting, so it's a good technique to try and master, especially during the colder months when the wood can be brittle. Willow shoots can also be twisted into withies, or another alternative could be the long flexible roots taken from needle bearing trees such as spruce or fir. At this time of year, after the winter storms, there's plenty of freshly fallen trees with exposed roots to harvest, so no need to damage a living tree. Moving into spring and early summer, various types of tree bark would work, again taken from a recently fallen or felled tree. Possibly even long trailing bramble stems once the thorns have been stripped away. Using only natural bindings means that all materials used on your woodland construction projects will eventually return to nature. Again, leave a clean sloping cut to shed rainwater and limit the chance of the dead shoot rotting. This technique isn't always necessary, but because my withies were quite thick, I decided to soften them further by pulling them around a tree. Always look up to check that the tree is sound first. Sizing up the frame poles here to ensure my butt won't just be sitting on the floor. Top tips. I need the ends of these poles to be slightly pointed to help seat themselves in the soft ground. I need to saw them here anyway so by angling the saw cut I can saw off what I need and leave a pointy end at the same time. Work smarter, not harder. Because withies aren't quite as flexible as rope, I'm using a timber hitch to start my lashing. It's easy to untie when no longer under tension and lends itself to more rough and ready bindings such as this. First, twist an eye into one end and then marry off what's left to become locked in place when the lashing starts. Those interlocking forks in the hazel poles really help to take some of the strain away from the withy lashing, although I know that a good thick withy like this will easily hold my weight. Apologies if you can see up my nose. Sawing poles for the seat. As with the frame, these poles need to be thick enough to support a heavy, tired person. The chair seat also needs to be wider than the backrest, so I cut each pole slightly shorter than the previous one to end up with tapering sides. Skip to the end. The first and last poles are left long as the extra length is required for hanging the hammock seat and fixing it to the frame, all will become clear. Each side of the chair seat has a twined pair of doubled over withy weavers to firmly hold the rungs in place. I choose two similar looking withies and overlay them tip to tip, then twist them together and form an eye that includes this overlapping join. 
This eye forms the first twist, and with the first rung in place, tension and the grippiness of the hazel withy helps to keep everything locked together. Then it's just a case of incorporating a new rung into each twist and keeping each twist as tight as possible. Make sure that every twist is made up by twisting both withy weavers together as a pair. A common mistake here is to twist the more flexible of the two weavers around the other one, which is nowhere near as strong. Avoid this by matching the weavers carefully so that they can work equally and evenly together and identifying and rectifying an uneven weave as soon as it happens. This oversized fitching weave is similar to the twining method used to make an open weave for fish trap baskets. I wonder if it would work for a whole hazel hammock for sleeping on or possibly a rope ladder. The same technique could even be used to make an Indiana Jones style suspended rope bridge. But for authenticity you'd need a deep gorge with a few man-eating crocodiles in the water below. Let me know if you give it a go. To finish off the twining weave, I double back with the extra length, following the same route in reverse, and friction did the rest. Lastly, a quick bit of trimming, fettling and fiddling to straighten everything out before fitting it to the frame. I kept the thickest withy back to make a short but very strong section of twisted rope with an eye on each end to secure the top rung of the hammock chair to the apex of the frame. Come on son, use your head. As you can see, I've tried to keep everything nice and tight. Minimal movement in a lashing means that it will stay lashed. To prevent movement in the frame, I'd already positioned the rear legs against a fallen tree, so I scooped out a couple of sockets in the forest floor for the front feet to sit in. And that's it done. A comfy chair for my camp in the woods. Nothing carried in apart from the basic hand tools I carry anyway. No synthetic cord used and when it reaches the end of its useful life, it will become firewood and beetle food. But does it work? Now it would possibly be unkind to say I've eaten all the pies but I've definitely had more than my fair share. However, the dimensions of the frame and the strength of the withies, the seat rungs and the lashings looks like it will hold my weight, I was in it.
Oh, feet off the ground and everything. With that forecasted wind and rain on its way, it's time to get a fire going. I scoop out a shallow pit to keep the heart of the fire warmer for longer and add a platform of dead dry ash wood to get the fire up out of the cold damp earth and increase the airflow to the fuel. In addition to the birch bark tinder I collected earlier, I've gathered some dead standing Douglas fir wood. This is straight grained. It can be cut between branch clusters leaving an almost not free section and if you find the right piece, can have a build up of flammable resin in the wood. It also splits fairly easily which is helpful when all you've got is a small knife and a mallet improvised from a hazel offcut to do the job. Split wood always catches fire and burns quicker than wood left in the round, perfect for getting the fire established when it's cold and damp. In addition to splitting kindling, I use my knife to carve a couple of the split lengths into long, thin, dry wood shavings for tinder. These can either be collected up and fashioned into a nest of wood shavings or left attached to the stick as a double whammy fire lighter of tinder and kindling all in one package, otherwise known as a feather stick. Now for the birch bark. This is a neat little trick which helps to prevent birch bark strips curling up like one of those fortune telling fish from a Christmas cracker, potentially extinguishing themselves in the process. I scrape super fine shavings from the outside of that panel of dead birch bark. These little paper thin wispy wonders will catch a spark and turn it into a flame. That's as long as the wind doesn't blow them away first. And there's the flame. Although the wind is generally coming from one direction, hence the rucksack windshield, it's a bit swirly and gusty so knowing how fast a well prepared fire can grow I decided not to risk melting my baggage and hoofed it out of the way. Here come the feather sticks. And those shavings. Now my bundles of kindling, matchsticks and pencils, fingers and thumbs. 
and now the bigger stuff paying attention to where the wind's blowing all the heat and the flames At this point the forecasted rain appeared so it was time for some hasty tarp erecting and to cobble together a windshield of sorts around the windy side of the fire using rotten logs. I didn't bring an iron pan for my steak, so I used more green hazel to make an adjustable pot hanger for my billy can. This angled saw cut is a preemptive cut across the grain known as a stop cut, which allows the carving of a couple of notches in my pot hook. This will give me two cooking height choices, a nice low simmer and steak burningly hot. The carving technique shown here looks like it breaks one of the main rules of safe cutting as it appears I'm cutting towards my own thumb. Actually it's a controlled cut, a very small slicing movement that can't ever make contact with my thumb but you need to practice and focus completely on correct technique when that knife's in your hand. Now wash your hands, or don't, whatever really. Yes, I cooked the steak too hot and too long, but despite that it was delicious. I popped a field mushroom on top, melted cheese all over it and presented the culinary masterpiece between two halves of a toasted bap. Shame I forgot to film it before tucking in, but here's a quick glimpse of it after I remembered. This isn't just any steak in a bun. This is a burnt half-eaten complete shambles of a steak in a bun grasped by a filthy grubby mitt. Hmm. Time to kick back by the campfire and get stuck into a good book. Oh, hello. The next morning, having forgotten all about the birch sap, I went back to retrieve it. Checking for insects and bird poo there. Oh, that's cold. Refreshing though. And so, 
With my quest for the ultimate bushcraft chair complete and my curiosity satisfied, I headed home. I hope you found this little film interesting, possibly even useful. If you did, please hit the like button and think about subscribing too. There's lots more bushcrafts to come. Thanks for watching.